Hello, everyone. Welcome to our uh, first scheduled hybrid brain math. Um, it is very exciting and, uh, of course, a bit, of, a bit stressful as well. So please just uh, excuse us if we have any, any, um, any issues, any problems. Um, the seminar series is co-sponsored by the P41 funded uh, Center for Measure Scale Mapping housed in Martino Center. Uh, today's uh, uh, speaker is Dr. Udna Nazado, uh, and we, I will give uh, the stage to David to introduce her, actually. So, David. Thank you very much, Ethel. Uh, it is an immense pleasure to introduce uh, Uduna today. Uh, she's a friend, colleague, uh, collaborator uh, for many years. I believe uh, we first met uh, back in an island uh, in Elba many years ago with Julie. Actually, that was the first time we, uh, the three of us met together. Uh, and it's an immense pleasure to have you here today uh, and being, being with, with you. Unfortunately, I'm COVID positive still. Uh, uh, and uh, I would love to be there uh, in person with you and, 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 and give you a night hug. And I hope I can do this uh, very soon, to be honest. So a little bit of, uh, 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 um, you know, uh, a biography of, of uh, about Uduna. She did her uh, PhD in medical biophysics at Western University, and uh, soon uh, she became uh, an accelerate fellow from the Mitax uh, organization uh, in Canada at the Lawson Health Research Institute in London, Ontario. She's been working in something that is also very close to my heart, which is improving quantification uh, uh, using PET-MRI and uh, doing that for uh, a quantitative uh, uh, neuroimaging. Uh, she's incredibly passionate about uh, basically improving diagnostic imaging and above all to uh, improving it for uh, the population in general for global health, yes. She's been the founder and chair of CAMERA, which is a uh, consortium of the advancement of MRI education and research in Africa. And it's a, basically a global network of experts, of MRI experts uh, working to establish sustainable access to high value MRI in Africa through local capability building. And I believe uh, her talk is going to be focused about uh, this population imaging uh, for neuroimaging and I'm super excited to, uh, uh, to see this presentation, to hear about it. So, Duna, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for coming here. Thank you so much, David. And it's, it's sad that you're not here, but I'm sure, like I told Julia, I'll drive back. I'm, it's five hours away, so I'm happy to drive back and, and get to see people that I'm not able to see right now. Um, it's been a whirlwind two days, but it's been really exciting to talk to some of you and start to share. This is early ideas. and. Mm -hmm. I'm going to try today to kind of summarize some of the work we've been doing in my lab, trying to use what David said, quantitative PET and MR imaging, and sort of pushing it towards population neuroscience or neuroimaging, and trying to make it accessible so it's not just doing population neuroscience or neuroimaging here, but actually doing it across the whole human experience. So making sure we're able to do this in places like Africa, in places like India, or, you know, back here in Boston. Um, so... Like David said, I started off at, I'm just gonna make sure my slides are advanced. Okay, hold on, sorry. There we go. So I started off at uh, London, Ontario. So that's, uh, if you don't know where London is, it's south east, uh, sorry, southwest of uh, Toronto. And I did my training here, both postdoc and uh, my uh, PhD. We have a PETMR. At the time, it was one of the first few ones, which is how I met most of you. Um, and then January of 2022, this year, I moved to the MNI. So still kind of selling in and, and trying to get uh, my lab set up. I do have a dynamic lab of seven students. So we're kind of in transition. Actually, I'm going back to London tonight to start scanning again on the PetMR because COVID sort of put like a little delay. So I'll, I'm kind of in between uh, two institutions right now. Um, so what my lab does is, you know, we're kind of trying to see if we can image this thing called the mind, which is a very metaphysical uh, entity. And over the past, I guess, few years, we've known for a long time that the mind is not just a, a, a metaphysical thing. It's actually embodied within the body and the brain. And, um, you know, we're not even talking about the environment and, and, you know, how some of these physical, social, cultural environments actually affect the body affect the brain and actually affect behavior. And the mind, um, uh, well, I say uh, areas that we're focused on is in cognition, related to think, to perceive, 
Um, and that's kind of what we are trying to just figure out how we can use pet and MR to image the mind and life uh, humans. And I believe that we could do that a little bit better if we actually start to think, if you actually start to think, sorry, if you actually start to think um, <laughs> along the uh, population neuroscience or, or epidemiology, how people have done that. Sorry, I'm gonna have to wait for that. Okay, I think I'm good now. So it's just kind of trying to think about this on a population level and sort of borrow ideas from what we've done in epidemiology, what we've done in uh, being able to look at infectious disease. We've done that in cardiovascular and stroke. We've been able to sort of find the biomarkers, discover risk factors, and then work back towards prevention, secondary prevention, and towards even better intervention. And the idea is, can we do that for something like dementia? Can we do that for something like depression or even the schizophrenia? So these mind challenges that are quite complex, can we figure out those biomarkers, those risk factors using imaging, and then find those prevention, potentially even better intervention strategies? And for us to do that, we kind of have to start imaging people along a population level. And to image people along a population level, we have to have tools that are accessible to do that. Um, and you know, throughout this, you're going to find little nuggets that I hammer into my students. Um, and I'm going to sort of show, share some of them because for me, we're trying to think about this from a broad sense, but also from a global sense, but also acting locally. And that is both uh, in the sense of looking at the brain locally, but also looking at it globally as it connects and broadly as it interacts with the environment, the social, uh, social uh, structures and stuff like that. And that also goes back to also how we design the tools think about the tools locally. We do all these experiments. Uh, I was talking to uh, Suzanne this, to, uh, this morning about OCT. That's very high level. We have 70 children is doing a high sense pet. These are very local tools, but these are tools that actually can let us benchmark, develop biomarkers that we can now expand globally in terms of the population level neuroscience and actually step back broadly and start to figure out how this imaging tools interact with all of this multi-scale. And I'll touch on that a little bit, which is like the environment, physical, social structure. So that's kind of how we are thinking about this. And like I said, this is more of sharing ideas. These are early stage of share some tools, but during the discussion of question and answer, I'll actually like to hear some reflection back as to how crazy this idea is, or as to if this is an approach that we all should maybe start thinking about. Um, so I'm gonna start with this quote. She's Canadian, that's the reason I put it there. So, so um, Patricia uh, Churkland said, very simple, to understand the mind, we must understand the brain. I'm gonna add, to understand the brain, you have to image it well. That's the only way you can understand the brain, is if you image the brain exceptionally well, then we can actually start to understand the brain and then walk backwards to understand the mind. So I'm gonna define the problem that we're trying to understand in my lab. Um, and that's what I call pathological cognitive aging, it's not, Aging in the sense of physical age is aging in the sense of biological age because uh, autism, um, uh, Down syndrome, Duchenne, the, these are younger age like disease, but they do show what looks like pathological cognitive aging um, because of the whatever pathological process that causes the brain to start to age. So it's not just uh, aging as in physical age. So I'm going to define that problem. And then I want to tell you the approach and the methodology we're trying to use to solve this complex mind problem of pathological cognitive aging, and then how we all can do that, because it's not, I don't think, I think where we are now in science, but the way globalization is happening is we actually have to start working together because um, not everybody has the infrastructure, not everybody has expertise, not every, like in one place, so we have to actually start to figure out how to work together to solve this. So I do want to sort of talk about how we can work together between labs or MGH and MNI or some of the work I'm doing in Africa. So I'm gonna sort of touch on that and actually end there. Um, so problem, um, I think what we know so far about the brain is that tip, tip, tip of the iceberg. And we, we have to sort of start to dive back in to see if we can see the whole picture. Now, again, I wanna define this problem. And this is one of those quotes I have into my students, um, you know, uh, Gilbert Chesterton said, it's, it isn't that they can't see the solution, it's that they can't see the problem. So 
if we don't understand the problem, we tend to create trade-offs and not solutions, right? So I, I kind of always want to see how much I understand this problem and imaging can actually help us understand the problem and actually turn around and help us solve that problem. So I'm gonna start off here with being able to make sure that we define the problem as much as we know so far, and then we can start to solve it as much as we can using population or imaging. Um, so what is the problem we're trying to solve? Sorry, Julie, it's a little too long. And for whom are we trying to solve that problem? This is where that population neuroimaging comes because if we don't understand that target population of people they were trying to solve this problem for, again, creating trade-offs and not, not uh, solutions, right? Um, so in my lab, we're really sort of trying to understand a pathological cognitive aging and cognitive aging goes, um, I think there are, now, sort of some shift in terms of the current model. I'm trying to get my laser pointer on. Sorry, give me a second. Yeah. So the current model is this progressive. We have this progressive sub, uh, subjective cognitive impairment. I feel um, like I don't quite remember things to what we can maybe measure with cognitive testing to what we can maybe behavior see as well as right now with imaging, for example, amyloid tau, stuff like that we can actually see. I mean, this is a current dominant model, but there are ideas around this alternate model. I'm not gonna get into that, but what I wanted to show you is that in my lab, we're looking at the entire spectrum of cognitive impairment. COVID kind of gave us an idea that infectious disease, I mean, we've known this with HIV, for example, that infectious disease can uh, also contribute or cause or, or you know, has some implication when it comes to cognitive impairment. We know injury uh, can also do that. Ischemic stroke, uh, ischemic heart disease, which is something that I worked on on my PhD, trying to show that brain atrophy, blood flow changes, uh, uh, vascular tone changes, um, even white matter um, uh, microstructural changes. We do see that in patients that have ischemic heart disease, especially patients that do have uh, what we tend to call a non ST, a non, a, sorry, non S, N S T M I. So that is non ST elevation myocardial infarction. Sorry, I woke up. <laughs> um, and so in those patients, the reason why we focus on those patients is because there is an atherosclerosis origin. And um, these are patients that do have uh, MI, and that MI is technically oftentimes. Uh, long-term, low-grade, chronic buildup of uh, uh, cholesterol that ends up leading to atherosclerosis, which is plaque formation, plaque growth. And that kind of almost mirrors what we probably see with ischemic stroke. And in those patients, we're trying to, we're, we're starting to understand that there is some evidence of cognitive impairment. Um, so we do know that there is a spectrum of cognitive decline. We tend to oftentimes focus on these guys, the dementias, right? Um, and then that's all great, um, but we have to also understand that there is some, um, some, some evidence that some of the pathologies that we're trying to, we tend to study here could actually be manifesting so much, to, some, to some extent here. And the patterns may be similar, the patterns may be different, but if we want to create biomarkers, if we want to use imaging to start to understand this, we have to actually be able to figure out who we're, who, we, who we're trying to target and also understand the disease across that spectrum. What we tend to focus on in my lab is we're trying to focus on this preclinical phase. This is before there's any evidence of cognitive impairment. I actually feel cognitive impaired right now. I think because I'm tired, but <laughs> if you ask me, I could swear I have a little bit of, you know, like memory brain fog and that could be just from traveling two months in Europe and coming here uh, two days ago. But um, if we sort of think about it, people in their 30s, 40s, 50s even, may start showing some borderline, but that's in the brain, functional, uh, molecular, neurochemistry changes that are so subtle that if you actually start to biomarker, fingerprint them down, find out what the risk factors are, um, then we will probably, when we get to this stage, be, or, or even prevent them from getting to this stage, but even if we don't prevent them from getting to this stage, it actually may be better to have interventions early on that may be more effective because if interventions we tend to apply it around this stage. So we're very focused on preclinical phase. So these are the people that we are with. So this is the whom that we think population neuroscience or population neuroimaging may actually be more applicable to, right? So this is actually looking at people when they're relatively 
healthy or what we call cognitively normal, but their brain may already start to undergo subtle blood flow changes, which um, we, not me, I wasn't there, but the group at the MNI, um, Itura Medina and Alan Evans group were able to demonstrate using ADNI. So this is ADNI data set. And the ADNI data set, the good thing about this data set, it, it's a PET MR, not PET plus MRI, but it's PET and MRI data set. So we have amyloid PET, um, we have FDG, ASL, blood flow, we have resting state, structural, and some plasma and CSF, amyloid and tau. And what they did was they actually tried to figure out what the biomarker, what they call abnormality is. So they had healthy controls where they set the threshold of what, say, the level of amyloid is on an, on an average healthy control. And then they started to look across uh, MCI, early, late, and um, late AD. So that's that time scale. And what they found was that there is this um, temporal progression where it tends to show, if looking at their data, that blood flow may be an earlier biomarker um, compared to, say, what we tend to think of, which is, for example, amyloid. Um, and so that this is kind of that early idea of population level neuroscience and being able to say maybe understand exactly what's going on here with other markers, say, for example, inflammation, which is what I'm interested in. And so once we're able to start to do this type of analysis, we can then start to work back and say, in a given geographical population, say, for example, in Africa, we're, we're starting to understand that Africans, most, mostly West Africans, in terms of their Alzheimer's disease profile, that they do have potentially more vascular burden compared to what we know so far in the West. And so maybe in that population, ASL may be even more important to so blood flow imaging, brain barrier dysfunction, white matter, microstructure, may be even more important biomarker in terms of trying to figure out the risk factor than say amyloid tau, amyloid or tau. And, and so that's where, when we're thinking about it, we also have to think about it globally, not just locally. Um, and so this is kind of where we, the interest in my lab comes in because this is an extension of, and, and one thing I have to say that this is actually an extension of the Jack Clifford model, which they extended here with vascular imaging, which now is extended a little bit with TSP. Again, people are trying to find this earlier biomarkers and there's some evidence um, this is a study from um, uh, Zenfan and um, the group in UC Davis. I want to not use Davis. Uh, one of the UC colleges. My brain is a little bit tired. But uh, what they what they showed here, and this is again in a, in a population of all. This is an Alzheimer's disease uh, uh, study again. But what they're trying to show here is using TSPO imaging, uh, PK195, early evidence of what seems to suggest that there is uh, some inflammatory um, biological pathway, but that biological pathway may have uh, maybe biphasic. So at the, at the, uh, earlier on, the brain may be exposed for whatever reason to this level of inflammation. It could be chronic low grade from diet, from stress, from infection, from whatever. Um, but there, there is this earlier stage where the brain is actually starting to trying to compensate. And also the inflammation may not necessarily be the pro or bad type inflammation that we tend to hear about. So there's this first peak. And then there is in some patients and some people that may have a dysregulatory profile in terms of how the inflammation, and we see this with COVID, for example, that there is a second peak that happens later on as they age, as they accumulate stress, infection, stroke, whatever, else disease that happens. So the second, now that second peak is what it's interesting because that's the, the chronic inflammatory peak that sometimes then leads to uh, interaction with amyloid, interaction with tau, for example. And so if we're able to actually start here and detect this uh, a threshold, we can actually start to be able to maybe uh, hopefully look at maybe controlling inflammation. Maybe that's one way we did that with cholesterol in stroke and uh, heart disease, we start to control for cholesterol. If we start to control for inflammation, it's actually can detect it, not just in the brain, but also in the body, because that signal comes from the body also to the brain. Maybe that could be one prevention, intervention strategy. And that's just, I keep saying maybe, but this is where imaging 
comes in because there's no other way to look at TSQ in live humans except with PET and maybe even dialing it back potentially to maybe doing some MR correlates of that and making it accessible. Um, now, I talked about who we're trying to target and that's that cognitively normal range, right? Where, the, where we still could do something. Now, how do we define cognitively normal, right? What's successful agent? And, and I like this model by Rowan Kahn because it, it actually has um, three core, well, I say um, factors. One of them is actually being able to minimize your risk for disease and disability. You can control that to a certain extent, right? Diet, exercise, blah, blah, blah. Having a, a continuous engagement in life, so having that social uh, uh, interaction that's actually healthy. And, and this, again, um, the brain does re respond to having this uh, social, uh, healthy social interaction. And then being able to maintain a high cognitive and physical function. Now, uh, if I, if, this is me recasting. If I look at this, I see a brain-body con uh, connection. So being able to minimize your risk of disease and disability, that's not just for the brain, that's also for the body. I see a mind-body connection, being able to have this high cognitive and physical function. I see a mind-body-brain environment connection. There is a physical, social uh, environment. Some, some people, there is a study uh, from UFT where they looked at uh, hospitalization rates of people that have uh, an ischemic disease, so stroke and uh, MI. And you're looking at people that live very close to the 401. Highway 401 is the big highway that leads all the way up into the US. Um, and the people that live further away from that, they're looking at traffic related air pollution. And they found that people that live very close to the 401 to certain kilometer range had a higher hospitalization rate. That's what it was replicated in London, Ontario and Windsor. So we know that there's this effect of the environment, right? Um, and then, the brain culture interaction. And I'm gonna show again later on how, when you sort of put this together from an individual to population that the culture actually does matter. If you actually look at how many people are able to have this successful aging, those cognitively normal, only 15% <laughs> by the time you get to age 85, you're not gonna be like Brenda Milner or this woman that just refused to retire. <laughs> and still able to function, right? And not a lot of us can be like Brenda, who's 102 years old. And I heard pre-COVID, she used to come to the MNI once a, once a week. So, um, but the, the one thing I wanted to point out here is there is potentially being able to have this low probability of disease. Because if you look at the uh, proportion of people that are able at the age of 80 to have this low probability of disease, you find that there's very few very few, very few proportion of the population. It's not something that we can 100% control, but it's something that if you actually understand the risk factors using imaging, we might be able to start to help them control this accumulating uh, burden of disease. Um, and I wanted to put this up because in terms of when we look at, again, uh, Alzheimer's disease in terms of their, uh, what we know so far, we know that not every person that shows positive amyloid will have cognitive impairment. We know that some people that have cognitive impairment don't have uh, uh, um, or have negative amyloid scans. So we're not too sure what's going on here. We know that abundant pathology is not, not that's not what we want. We don't want to have this accumulation of pathology amyloid tau information. Um, but we also know that some people are able within all that to have this resistance to that. We need to understand why and how. Um, and we know, like I said, there's some people that have no pathology, but uh, cognitively aging and frail. And we see that in, for example, in Duchenne, autism, so that, that type of spectrum. So we have to be able to really understand whom, and this is where, again, population neuroscience with imaging on population neuroimaging can actually help us to start to understand that. I'm gonna skip a little bit faster now. So um, this is a very complicated diagram. It, it's a really good paper in PNS from Emily Falk, um, you might recognize some names here if you attend ISM, I'm like, don't know. But what they were trying to do here is introduce this, this idea of population neuroscience and being able to do it with neuroimaging. Um, and this is, you've, it's kind of hard me touching this a little bit. There is that culture aspect that I talked about here, right? Um, there is obviously what we do all the time, our bread and butter, which is trying to understand the cell function neurotransmitter with imaging. Um, there is the environmental, social, uh, aspect to it. There's also the lifespan, right? 
going from neurodevelopment to aging. And then there is the culture aspect to it. Um, and our social family network, and then the individual. So we tend to sometimes, when you go to the physician, this is what they look at. They're looking at you, right? Um, and But they're trying to learn from a population extrapolate to you. You is your immediate family, people in this room, like family, um, your, your immediate community, and then your country, your, your geographical area. And that geographical area is very, very, does matter. Um, so when we start to actually talk about population neuroscience, so far, we're just kind of doing this whole brain, floating head type of image. Now, how do we do the whole body in an individual, scale that up to population where we're actually able to link it up and, and, and start to include all these variables? Um, I like what Xi Yan Zhao, I think I said the name right, um, from Beijing Normal, Normal University is trying to do that. This is how he has sort of simplified to a certain extent this very complicated model of trying to do publish in the resigns. Um, there are human behaviors that we kind of tend to study. Um, if you just focus on crime rates, predicting why some people commit crimes than others, is that something related to the brain environment? But, you know, um, the individual differences, um, the cohorts, what cohorts? Do we look at? Do we look at from the very young, trying to see, for example, if malnutrition has some effect on learning? We know that education could be a neuroprotector. People have talked about cognitive reserve. Should we start that young? Like, where do we start? Like, where do we focus on the cohorts? Uh, um, and then, you know, this is kind of where my lab sort of comes in, and this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to figure out how we could use that bread and butter. And when I say bread and butter, because MR is getting a bit more accessible, and I told you that, MR imaging, and be able to find biomarkers that can allow us to now uh, look at the interaction between all of these multi-level variables and start to maybe understand on a population level some of the risk factors that we can prevent 20 years out, 30 years out, so that people don't end up having whatever cognitive decline on whatever spectrum they're on, if that makes sense. And so that's kind of basically what we're trying to do. PET is very important to us because a lot of these cell neurostructure, neurotransmitter work, neuromodulation work are stuff you do with PET. PET is not accessible. So then how do we take some PET, use it as a benchmarking tool, so basically to benchmark blood brain barrier dysfunction, which is something I'm gonna show we're trying to do and then be able to know the sensitivity of what our measures are. I sort of compare this to PCR versus um, rapid kits. And we know what, how sensitive. So we do know, uh, we can benchmark some of these imaging tools and we can potentially do that with PET and then scale back with something as accessible as MR. So that's kind of what we're trying to do um, uh, in my lab. And I'm just gonna quickly, for time, go through some of the models there was an approach they were they were actually trying to do this from. We're working at this with two two from two angles. One is just trying to figure out if there are existing models that we can use to start to understand this brain body environmental interaction, um, and the other one is what tools can we sort of uh, design and develop with all of this with intention of being able to do this broadly. So think broadly think globally at, lo at locally, and I've already talked about this. And so I'm gonna to touch on quickly this hard brain connection model that we've been working on in my lab on both with animal studies and what we're trying to do in humans. And then just kind of quickly for the sake of time, brush up on, on some PET and MR tools that were sort of starting to develop. These are early stage, we haven't applied them to any population. They were just kind of starting to think ahead. Our goal is whatever we're trying to do is to make sure that we're making it accessible and being able to general, generalize those imaging tools. Don't want to create imaging tools that are not accessible and they would not be able to be generalized to the, to the population. Um, so quickly about this hard brain connection. Now the, the motivation for this comes back to this, being able to see if we can um, understand the role of inflammation when it comes to cognitive decline or when it comes to how it interacts with atrophy, uh, white matter, uh, microstructure changes, or all the other stuff that we tend to see in brains of the ischemid, ischemia patients. Um, and so this is the approach. Now, you know, it's, inflammation is something that's ubiquitous. It happens on all 
tissue and organs in the body in response to anything, stress, infection. Um, I think I wrote infection twice, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, and so this is what we, we're aiming at. Uh, the study that we've applied for ethics was sort of put on hold because of COVID, but now I'm trying to kickstart that, this study. And this is where we're trying to actually use this uh, acute MI model, where we have patients come in within a few days within the MI. Uh, this is when we think that the reparative or that M2, like that, that um, anti-inflammatory, whatever you want to call it, that uh, population is still slightly a little bit high. That's that first peak. And then we have them come back six months later, because if you actually follow the profile of, of ischemia, both in the brain, so stroke, and in the heart, typically at six months, that high level of inflammation in the ischemic region, so in the heart, it would be around the infarct, in the brain, it would be around the infarct, that tends to go down in general. In the population where it doesn't, the question is why? First, we want to be able to detect that. And we're trying to do this when I wrote this grant, I used the loss gain function. This is 2019 pre-COVID, so that loss gain function is not something that people like to say anymore. But what I meant by that is being able to actually build in an intervention where we, if we did intervention and we see a decrease in inflammation, uh, a recovery in terms of brain volumes and increase in brain volume, we know that that inflammation is potentially meaningful. And so we wanted to design this study where we had the patients go to cardiac rehab. Cardiac rehab is a multi-intervention study. It's like a finger study if you, if you, if you do um, Alzheimer's disease where it has a diet, exercise, a smoking cessation, um, as well as, um, um, what's it called? Uh, psychosocial intervention. So they, sometimes they do see a psychiatrist or a psychologist if they have depressive symptoms. And so the idea is to have them go to this multi-intervention that has this aerobic exercise component. We know that exercise is really neuroprotective. We've seen that in the same cohort of patients. That's basically what my PhD was, where we're able to show uh, increase in brain volume, uh, increase in blood flow, and some something that looks like a uh, uh, change in vascular tone. And we did that with ASL, so we did that with imaging. So the idea is to have those patients go to cardiac rehab, not all of them, because cardiac rehab in Canada, at least in London, is part of standard of care. Patients can turn it down, 40% of them do, which is kind of great because if 40% are turning it down, we can then follow them and see if their inflammatory process or, or the, if the brain keeps having this higher load of inflammation in some of them. The ones that do go to cardiac rehab, the hypothesis is that we can see a decrease in inflammation. Now, this is not something that we came up, I came up all by myself. This is a study that has been done uh, by James Thackeray's group in Munich, where they looked at mice models of MI, and they're able to show um, con concurrent increase in inflammation in the brain and in the heart at that four weeks, which is kind of similar to our seven to 10 day, one week, so which is similar to a seven to 10 day. They also showed that same high level of inflammation in the heart and the brain using TSPO PET imaging at eight weeks. This is our six to seven months. Now, the, the animals that had, and I, I should have put that slide here, sorry. The animals that had, um, they gave some of the animals an anti-inflammatory agent, and the animals that got that tend to show this decrease in inflammation in the brain, but more importantly in the heart at six, well, eight, eight, eight weeks, which is equivalent to our six months in human time, time span. Now, what I wanted to point out here is that this is like that intervention where we know that if we do an intervention and that signal goes away, that signal is actually doing something. And that's potentially what we can now sort of extrapolate and see if we can look at other organs in the body. And this is what we're trying to do with the shame. So we're doing this TSP imaging, looking at heart, brain, gut. Um, we actually looked at the muscle as well. But here I'm showing you what we just focused on, which is the brain and the heart. This is a PEPA, 18 f PEPA, which is very similar to the PBR. 128 that you guys use here. Um, this is a, the wild type, one example, and uh, uh, a Duchenne mice. And in Duchenne, they have two, um, uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, they have dystrophin and eutrophin. So they have two uh, uh, genotypes that you can knock out. Uh, and that kind of gives you like, a way of looking at severity. So looking at uh, animals that have Eutrophin plus uh, dystrophin, you, that could be a mild. When they have two knockouts, that could be a severe, and that gives you that time scale. So we're able to show um, in a small cohort of mice, uh, this increased potentially evidence of inflammation related to Duchenne in the heart and the brain. 
that we're able to validate or sort of look at with autoradiography as well as biodistribution. And we see that that's across all organs in the body. They're very interested in doing this in humans. Um, and we are still in the process of trying to get funding to be able to start, actually start to go back and do this. We don't have a total body pet, but we can just kind of do a pet the old fashioned way. But now that we have total body pet, that's a question. Can we now start to do population level neuroscience with total body pet? And if so, I'm gonna skip through this because of time. And if so, can we actually start now to put, bring in those environmental variables that I talked about earlier, um, be able to even look at vascular dysfunction, which we can do now with ASL, for example, blood flow and blood membrane dysfunction, look at oxidative stress, we can do that to certain extent with MR, we can also do that to certain extent with PET. Um, and in our group, we're trying to look at inflammation in relation to blood membrane dysfunction in humans. This is all brain only for now, but the idea eventually is to start to look at this on a, on a uh, brain body, so the inflammation in the brain body and the uh, Robin dysfunction is still be just brain and trying to sort of correlate that and work this back to see some of this environmental uh, data. Um, so this is a study that two of my students are now starting to do. This is what I'm going to go back tomorrow and start working on, which is where we're trying to validate uh, PET measures of blood brain barrier dysfunction. So that's the old fashioned carbon 11 butanol plus O15 water, looking at water exchange and sort of relating that back to blood brain barrier dysfunction. And we're trying to do this and validate a new MR technique with using ASL that actually allows us to measure water exchange. And this is where we're trying to make that biomarker more accessible. And PET becomes your PCR and BBASL becomes your rapid. But we need to know what that error margin is. And this is what we're trying to do. So Stephen is trying to make carbon 11 butanol um, specific activity really high enough for us to do multiple scans. We have an animal validation model. We're trying to use aquaporin inhibitor so we can actually evaluate before and after uh, the blood and barrier dysfunction. And then we're going to do two human validation, one in stroke. We know stroke has already that BBB dysfunction. And then we're trying to look at the sensitivity, doing it in MCI and AD patients. Again, both validating the ASL with the PET measurement. The idea at the end is to make sure that that PET measurement or ASL measurement is a little bit more accessible, which we can eventually turn around and use for population level neuroscience. Um, so some of the PET tools. Um, we've sort of spent time trying to figure out how to make quantitative PET blood-free. What I mean by that is if you're going to do kinetic modeling, which you guys already know, some friction to the choir, you need the atrial input function. That's serial scanning of blood measurements. If you're doing something like TSPO, you need to still take those blood measurements because you have to look at the met metabolites. We're trying to figure out how to make PET a little bit more blood-free because if you make it blood-free, then you can make it more amendable to population-level neuroscience. Um, and so we've sort of focused on being able to design software and tools that are very um, uh, straightforward to use. All you need is your raw PET and MR data, in this case with the software, and you'll be able to use the MR information to guide the PET delimitation of your vessel. So you can do image drive input function, pull out the input functions, and then do pet like based type of parametric mapping to get your parametric maps. Um, and so we've designed these tools uh, in the Siemens back end, which is Mavis Lab. Um, and um, this is not available actually on Siemens uh, uh, Frontiers Marketplace. And you, if you email me, I'll give it to you. It's very simple to use. You input your PET and MR. The PET and MR doesn't have to be simultaneous because within the two, we have a registration process, two step that actually allows us to align the MR and the PET very well based on the vessel, inf vessel information. And that actually allows us to be able to get input functions that are pretty. Think pretty good. We know what our error margins are about five to six percent, which is kind of typical for image drive input functions. Uh, and we've tested this on FDG, PSMA volume, and uh, sodium fluoride. So it's not just for brain imaging, again, going towards a population level uh, neuroscience or population level imaging in this case. And this is just an example showing how we validated this in FTD, uh, looking at differences between brain regions with SUVR and differences when you actually do the full blown quantification, but now trying to make it blood free, we see that there's a little bit more um, effect size when you're doing quantification compared to when you're doing uh, relative SUV values. So we're also trying to just increase the uh, uh, image contrast, or improve, I should say, the image contrast of PET and the noise it. We're trying to do this two ways. One is analytically by trying to sort of, um, by trying to sort of, 
uh, pay attention to how we choose the hyperparameters that we use for what it's called maximum a posterior. So this anatomical guided PET reconstruction where the MR information can sometimes be overwhelming the PET. So you can actually control your priors. To a certain extent, people tend to use this fixed value for, to control the objective function. We're trying to just make it a little bit adaptive. And that's what we did here in combination with, or in collaboration with Jorge Cabello uh, at Siemens, Knoxville. I'm gonna skip through this quickly. This is just in a fandom where we, we know what, um, where we're able to simulate the pattern DMR. This is with just that fixed hyperparameter. This is when you make it a bit more um, adaptive. But making it adaptive, you can actually increase your number of iterations without having the noise uh, accumulate so much. Um, and that's what we're trying to show here at one minute versus five minute scan. Again, trying to figure out if we want to do dynamic PET imaging, can we denoise it enough that we can then go low dose? If you go low dose, you can do population neuroscience because you can repeat your scans. You can also even look across lifespans because you're able to image pediatric kids. Um, and again, this is here basically showing how by controlling this hyperparameter, you're able to control the strength of your prior. So if, say, for example, you have a lesion on the PET, but that's absent on the MR, uh, or a lesion that's an artifact on the MR that appears like a lesion on the MR, because again, that could happen if you have a low resolution MR, say, for example, in the 1.5, 0.53, 0.3 T scanner, does that information still bleed into your PET? And we're trying to show by, by using adaptive hyperparameters, we're able to actually, for, for a certain extent, constrain that anatomical pry where it doesn't bleed over into the PET. Um, and this is an example application of this in epilepsy, where we have our standard uh, OSCM reconstruction, clinical three iterations, 21 subsets. So this is not we didn't sort of mess around with the clinical reconstruction parameter. We tried to pull out our epileptic focus, so basically the area of the brain that shows hypometabolism, just by doing asymmetrical index or comparing to other parts of the brain. Um, and then we did our map uh, reconstruction. We did try to figure out if we did a point spread function modeling of the uh, of the OSCM, if we did a map uh, point spread function uh, reconstruction. We're able to show to a certain extent, and this is just one example, that the focus, so we're able to improve a little bit on the contrast. Uh, so the focus, the epileptic focus becomes a bit more focal, and that's basically what we're trying to show here. We're trying to now look at this in 20 epilepsy cases, and, and, and we're just starting to acquire pediatric cases as well to see if this is something that we could do. Again, if you think the population level uh, imaging, you're thinking about being able to say, uh, um, decrease the dose of a PET uh, uh, data, but use MR to improve the contrast and still be able to do multiple repeated scans. Um, also trying to look at dose reduction or, or be able to do low dose, low dose AI, deep learning, everybody's doing deep learning these days. So we're starting to do that. And uh, uh, I think Julie, you met uh, uh, Raymond. Uh, and also Pauline. Yes, and Pauline. So Raymond is trying to do this, uh, it's a way of doing, general adversarial network, but basically we're trying to really focus on modeling and understanding the noise uh, a little bit better. So using noise as a feature and be able to see if we can use that to then improve on our ability to uh, re reconstruct back or, or, or regain back the PET signal even in really low one minute, two minute scans. And this is still early phase. Uh, he's going to present this at IEEE. We didn't get our brain abstract in on time, so, so he wasn't able to present that, right? And uh, this is something else we're trying to do again, just, just kind of thinking about population level neuroscience, but now making it more generalizable. We're trying to take clinical grades. So these are your clinical 1.5, 0.3T, 0.5T. We got some data from Africa, actually. We were able to sort of see how well we can generalize the models for being able to extract features. In this case, a feature is lesions. We want to make sure that we're able to do this in a way that if we had data from Boston, from Nigeria, from whatever, we can use one model and be able to extract features and then look across population. Problem with doing this in places where there are low resource is that not everybody has access to contrast MR, diffusion weighted ASL, so multispectral data, which, for example, if you look at like, like work around this area, for example, the brain tumor segmentation challenge from Nikai, they tend to provide data set that's multi-spectral, that's multi-parametric. Most places in Africa 
just don't acquire those type of data sets. They have the bread and butter T1 and T2 weighted imaging. The idea is can we use those low shot, few shots, so few images, low quality, and still be able to extract our features? Because that's how you get. If you're going to population level neuroscience, you have to make it accessible. Gonna skip, skip through this, but we're trying to again use this gun like general material network, uh, be able to learn from multiple shots. So basically, we took the BRATS data, simulated it to low uh, resolution, so aim plane of about five to eight millimeters, and then try to see if we can uh, learn glioma images. So being able to predict glioma lesions from ischemic stroke, because glioma can sometimes look like mimic stroke. And the idea behind that is if you go to a low resource area, uh, sometimes because of the low quality of the images, sometimes they read gliomas as mimic strokes. And so being able to start to think back and do this type of analysis is basically what we're trying to do. So this is early results. Um, here, uh, Dong is comparing his uh, method, so the sign method, to ground truth data because this is BRAT, so we do have our labels to the top performing BRAT methods that are out there right now. And because we're now trying to be able to generalize our methods a little bit better and include data sets, this low quality, few shots of T1 and T2, um, big resolution, big voxel, sorry, big voxel images, we're able actually to segment the uh, lesions better, both on glioma and stroke, even though we train just on glioma data sets. Um, so, I'm just going to sort of pause here and kind of talk about how we can start to do this population level neuroscience together. There's other things we're doing that I don't have time to put here, for example, and I may have talked to some of you about this. We're actually trying to, again, using this clinical grade uh, MR data sets, talk about maybe green, what they call green radiology, to so being able to recycle, reuse, and renew our clinical data sets and trying to say if we can use deep learning. <clears throat> to improve the resolution of it, can we start to do just basic connective, uh, basic uh, cortical thickness or brain, uh, uh, or, uh, brain volume changes or look at white matter uh, hyper intensities on these clinical images that we acquire every day. So that's kind of what we're trying to do. I don't have results. I was trying to get, get her to give me something last night, but I wasn't able to put something together quickly, but how can we work together? Very complex problem. Um, you know, this is not something that could be done only in the West. We've tried that. We've come fast to get in neuroscience and neuroimaging in the West. We don't have to start to come together so we can go far and be able to actually start to solve this and understand the brain and how it interacts with the body and how it interacts with the environment and how we can actually start to prevent cognitive impairment. Um, so where are MR scanners? I, if I put PET here, it would be even more, more uh, sad. Uh, most of them is in the, in the West, 80% of the world don't have good access to high value MRI. And high value is not the scanner, it's the capacity to use those scanners. Um, but if you look at the global burden of disease, it's not in the West. It's basically where we don't tend to expect it to be because when you look at Africa, when you look at Southeast Asia, think of infectious disease. That transition is changing to where it's becoming incidence of, think of any uh, non communicable disease, heart, uh, heart disease, stroke, dementia, it's kind of rising over there. That's where the burden of disease is. That's where population neuroimaging should go. Um, and so, how, we ca how can we bridge that gap? This is what David talked about camera. Uh, this is something that naively, naively is a good word, started in my postdoc, PhD, towards the end of PhD, thinking, oh, I'm just going to go there and teach them MRI. <laughs> It doesn't work that way. <laughs> the first thing we did was we actually did a needs assessment survey. We wanted to fully understand what the needs are before we can galvanize in there in a white chart and try to fix the problem. We wanted to actually understand the problem so we can create the solution and our trade off. And from the needs assessment, we actually understood that they need advocacy because a lot of the problem is that there's no political will for healthcare. The funding, healthcare fund in Africa is like less than 1% for almost every African state except for South Africa. So there's no political will. The government, if they get any money, will go fund HIV, mosquito, whatever. They won't fund non communicable diseases, which is where we come in in terms of neuroimaging. So we really have to advocate for that and advocate also with the vendors. A lot of these scanners are clinical grade scanners in, in clinics. They don't have access to research licenses. So we can't import our ASL and all this fancy stuff to the scanners. So we have to figure out how we can do that. 
training is very important. And this is where I think we can, you guys can work with us to figure out how we can train people better, but we have to train them in place, train them where they are, not export them here to train them, train them on their scanners, you can train them on your brain PET MR insert and they go back, they have no brain PET MR insert, I'm not looking at you for it. <laughs> but you have to train them based on, this, on the equipment that they have. Some of these scanners are, if you look at it, it says Siemens, but it's not Siemens that's slapped on that badge. They, those are maybe five-year-old, whatever it's called, Tara, uh, not Tara, but the era, era. When it comes back to Africa, it's called Esperanza. And I have pictures of that. But that's not Siemens. That's just a third-party vendor that has been licensed through Siemens to do that. There's no connection between them and Siemens. So their apps training is very limited. They don't have access to a lot of sequences. I mean, I mean a lot of sequences. So when they do bread and butter imaging, that T1 and T2 is not optimized. So you have to train them in place based on the scanner they have to get them to now know how to tweak and optimize MR sequences. Networking. Uh, without the networks, you can have access to uh, the, if you want to do population level neuroscience, you have to find the, the, the clinician, the scientist to work with. So those networking is very important. And I think when you do all this stuff, when you advocate train network, then we can get towards innovation with population level neuroscience. I think I'm running out of time. Um, so how can we work together? Um, I talked to Bruce about training. I'm not gonna get into that, but there's a way to figure out how to train students in place being here. And that's something that we can work together on. This is what we're trying to do right now. We're trying to create this African neuroimaging archive. This is one way of, I talked about that green radiology, that ability to make sure that our models are deep learning stuff is generalizable. We're trying to create this African neuroimaging archive Right now, we have 15 clinics in Ghana, Nigeria, Tanzania, Rwanda, where we're trying to get data sets. These are clinical data sets that they've acquired, take them, curate them, annotate them, and start to release them. The first release hopefully will be next year's Bratz Challenge, where we release glioma annotated data sets for whoever that wants to use it to do machine learning or just to do straight up uh, grim matter volume, you know, stuff like that. So we're trying to do that. And I think this way is one way of also building capacity because in Africa, they, when you look at their computational uh, informatics, it's all fintech, financial stuff. Nobody, there's very little work in healthcare. And we're trying to see if we can also through this start to build some capacity for them to start to do image and informatics. Because that way, when we get towards being able to do big data population level neuroscience, we already have people in place that we can work with, that power of experience that we can work with. So I'm gonna almost just probably end here. And <laughs> I think a take home message is this. To understand the mind, we have to understand the brain. To understand the brain, we have to think about how we image it. And I think we have to start thinking brain, heart, brain, gut, connection, how can we use PET to do that? How can we do that here globally and also broadly when we start to bring in environment, social, culture, stuff like that. So thank you so much for your time. I'm happy to have any discussions or questions. Thank you. Thank you, Edna. Um, so uh, we will start with actually the room for uh, people who are here in person. Um, thank you for the great talk, by the way. Um, so if you have any questions, please just raise your hands and if uh, people online would like to ask questions, please just write it in the q a box or raise their hands virtually. Um, is there anyone who would like to ask questions here? Um, I'm still awake, 70%, so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of us? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for the feedback. It's probably a very general question I ask it, but I was wondering, because you talked a lot about the multimodal imaging major field, I was wondering how, I mean, your choice, I mean, in this case, you're focusing on MRI, mm -hmm. but how does that, how is that going to limit, um, or, 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 yeah, limit basically our understanding, because as you said, the, the problem, for example, is not about our language, disorder. It's like very complicated. So that our choice of tools, this imaging tool, is going to basically limit the kind of results we can potentially get. Mm. How do you um, how 
basically how do you choose that? How do you choose the imaging so, or, or how, how you... I started with what I know. This is what I was trained on at NMR. And so that's kind of where I started and that's kind of where I'm still early on. I'm not Julie or Bruce yet. <laughs> so maybe 25 years from now and I may be able to switch and find you. Uh, but you know, optics is something that we tend to I, I shouldn't say tend to in neuro in neuroimaging, optics doesn't have that much relevance as MR and PET. And optics, there's something to be said about optics imaging, especially even as a molecular imaging tool, question mark. And I think there's a potential in optics, uh, NIRS, infrared, for example, to occupy that space. And actually, that's a type of portable tools that we could potentially say benchmark to PET. For example, so looking at CMR, CMR2, for example, which you can do a little bit with optics. Um, and so, and that's more accessible than MR or PET. So that could be one. What about electrophysiology? Electrophysiology is one of them. Yeah, EG is one of them. Yeah, MEG. Yeah, yeah. I was going to ask the same thing. I don't know nothing about MEG, but yes. I mean, not, I haven't used MEGs to explore it that way, but yes, MEG for sure. I'm not sure how accessible MEG is. I don't know what the, what the uh, human, uh, infrastructure is required for MEG, so maybe it is. I don't know. I mean, I was going to ask you to the same thing. Like MEG, yeah, uh, it's not always always accessible, but EEG is way more yeah. accessible. Um, and also uh, for epilepsy, for example, yeah. a lot more data sets. Yeah. Um, but also, again, for epilepsy, for example, there is a lot of um, work uh, done with uh, MEG, EEG together, and yeah. also, for example, using connectivity analysis and so on. Uh, is it possible to combine all those with a, I don't know, inter intermodal, like inter, not interdisciplinary in a way, but in a way, interdisciplinary uh, yeah. collaborations? I think my bias with PET and MR is that spatial information. And the reason I have that bias is because if you look at the brain, the brain is not evenly affected. There's only some parts of the brain that tend to be affected. Those are, tend to be also deep brain regions. Um, we don't understand the regional pattern a lot about when it comes to brain abnormality. So some of these non-spatial resolution EEG, MEG, I think that if, if we're trying to do population level neuroscience, those tools could be like a second level. You know, we get the PCRs first, we know what they're doing, and then you can start to make it rapid, you know, make them whichever way you want. So that's kind of where I think MEG may come in. I'm not sure, but that's up to debate. That's just kind of what I'm thinking. I think the pet and MR trying to start somewhere and get that spatial information. I think that's where the pet and MR may be the, that's just a thought. Yeah, for epilepsy, I do know that the MEG actually has uh, not so bad spatial like, mm -hmm. resolution as well. Yeah. For, for especially just uh, choosing the, um, uh, in in choosing actually uh, or finding the epilepsy the epileptic Epi focus, I mean non regional example. epilepsies Ep epileptic focus okay, okay. regional yeah. epilepsies yeah. Um, uh, in the meantime we have a question from David so David could you unmute yourself please hi you're doing an amazing talk I love it thank you very much really. So I have a, 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 a probably a tricky question. I mean, uh, uh, you know, I'm also a deep learning uh, enthusiast, uh, but I know how how much uh, uh, push back with these uh, novel techniques are, are have fallen on the you know on the clinical settings. Um, but I believe that it could be an amazing tool for this population based uh, on global health, uh, 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 you know, vision that you are having. How how do you think we can convince? Uh, clinicians and how we can export these amazing tools that we have at hand right now that you're developing, for instance, and, and convince people that, you know, these are, you know, there are drawbacks, obviously, but every method has a drawback, but they are amazing tools. They are fast. They are quick. They, they, they help a lot and that they can be used uh, in, in a very effective way. I know it's a complicated question. No, that's a great question. I just put an ideology AI editorial about that. So. <laughs> So I'll send that to you. It should be coming out maybe in a couple, a month or so. Um, I think AI or deep learning, the, where, it, where it probably plays a bigger role is in low research settings. Um, I went to a few clinics when I was in Nigeria. This radiologist are non-subspecialized. They flip from MR to ultrasound to x-ray to that's just, and they're, they're servicing a population that's four times the size of Boston. 
Uh, so, you know, it becomes really hard for them to be able to accurately diagnose something in such a short period of time. So being able to have this AI rapid diagnosis, that is where it actually becomes really helpful. I think the clinicians here, I, I'm not a clinician, I don't want to speak to them this is in the room, but I, I don't know the pushback is on this side. But I think it's something that we should probably start to embrace because when it comes to, what you said, the real population level neuroscience, these are big data. And uh, when it comes to big data, computers do it better than humans do. And especially when it comes to big data in low research settings where the data quality is bad, computers do a better job than humans do. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, that was, that was great. Thank you. I just have a general question. How, actually, I have two, but anyway, how uh, prevalent or whatever? Or how accessible is FCG or something like that in these settings? And that's one question. And then the second question is, um, I imagine now that you're at uh, Montreal, you have a wealth of data yeah. across the age range, yeah. Yeah. across AD with CSPO yeah. with yeah. the uh, Pedro has that. Yeah, Pedro has that. How you might use that data uh, to further develop your methods or your approach for population. Yeah. For your, uh, yeah. So the first question was uh, how prevalent is FDG? I, I, I should have put up the, the scanner for scan distribution for PET. But uh, between 2019 and 2022, there's five PET CT and psychotrons installed in Africa. I'm going to use Africa as an example yeah. because yeah. it's the least resourced and it's the hardest place to do anything in terms of uh, uh, healthcare, let alone expensive stuff like imaging where you're fighting nature because it's always hot and there's really no cooling system and the, the power is on and off. So it's very hard to do medical imaging. So I'm going to keep talking about that because that's what I know. And also, I believe you can solve the problem in Africa. You can solve it anywhere else because the problems are too complex. But for FDG, um, so there are cyclotrons now. There's one in Nigeria, two in Kenya, one in Tanzania. Um, and so it's not the entire continent. Oh, South Africa always has, uh, South Africa and Egypt, they do have cyclotrons. Yeah, yeah. But FDG is, it's, predominantly what they do because these uh, PET CTs and oncology clinics, they're not in neuro clinics. So convincing them to do amyloid and tau is what we're trying to do. They don't see the, they don't see the need for that. No. There's no money no. for that. Yeah, yeah, you could still do FDG, no. but, right, but this is oncology clinics and they don't really no. want neuro people in there yet. They have loans to pay back. Uh, that's exactly what I've actually been told. <laughs> so research is kind of not what they are. They don't, they don't actually do research. They've never done research. These are clinics. Uh, they're not academic hospitals, except for the one at Aga Khan University. So it's, it's where the advocacy really comes in and how can we get them to start to see the value of doing PET in the brain. The brain is not. In terms of PET imaging. Yeah, exactly. It's not, it's not addressed at all. That's your first question. The second question is, um, oh yeah, yes, M and I data. I think this is a type of stuff that uh, Alan likes to do, which is I'm just going to go back to sorry, go back to, oops, this. Um, yeah, so they're trying to sort of keep working along on this. How much I can contribute, I have no. I just no, got there, but yeah, but that's the data set is there, and that's the kind of stuff we're trying to do. And this is great work because this actually told us that. This might be really important. And how can we get ASL and 1.5T from 15 years ago that we don't have research license for in places like Africa? So just being able to even do this is what gets us to get to that point where we can start to include ASL without FDG or PET. Might don't, you know, we can just start from here and do this three. We can do it right now. In places and across Africa, right? Maybe use that for the library. Right, exactly. Right. But we still have, like I said, to me, PET is really great at being that benchmark, that benchmark tool that we can then scale backwards. Yeah. Um, but I do have a question. Is that okay? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, so um, you know, 
this is MGH, you know, this uh, something to be said about the name. Um, you know, there's 70 Patamar, OCT, all of these tools. Uh, like, how do you guys as a community see the role of doing this on a population level, neuroimaging? Like, um, where does that fit within, say, for example, some of the work that you do? I know a lot of the work they do here, really basic science, which is great, but is there any, um, is it something that potentially could be of uh, interest? I'm not looking at Bruce, I'm just looking, <laughs> just looking around. <laughs> I mean, it, it's certainly of interest to, to many of us. Uh, you know, people, for example, are you know, very active in uh, mining data from, say, the UK biobank. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. You know, I think as, as a community, we're beginning to understand the power that these large uh, data structures have to address look for uh, 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 correlations and insights into the underlying biology mm -hmm. uh, you know, of disease in ways that are much harder to do if you have the data that are in the field. Right. And, and that's where the AI tools, of course, you know, come in. And, you know, this is, and that's not only just one domain where we're looking at our structures. The challenge, as, as you were saying, is you know, there's no equivalent to the human biology. Mm -hmm. in Africa. Yeah. One of the domains, again, that may relate to that, is we're talking about the fact that there's, you know, the, the, the technology that does exist. Yeah. So all of yeah. Is, but there are other folks here, for example, that are working very hard to go back to, say, our historic and then try to draw quantitative inferences mm -hmm. from, say, the MRs that were acquired 20 years ago. Right. Those tools, of course, could also be applied exactly. to the data that's yeah. being acquired today in the kind of clinics that, that do exist. Mm -hmm. I think it'd be super interesting to see if we could get some access to those data yeah. across what data sources there are and see if some of these advanced AI tools might allow us to kind of draw mm -hmm. from them in ways that we may not have you know, appreciated in the past that are you know, accessible in mm -hmm. that data. But you know, our current resource suggests we do. Yeah. And that's another domain where the kind of um, tools that we're developing in other settings, you know, for example, with our historic longitudinal data may be appropriate to be able to look at mm -hmm. uh, populations. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I and think probably a hundred other examples. Yeah, and maybe for Julian Chipper and this brain body, I mean, I, this is this is on M and I, where that neuro just Cuts everything below the neck down is very very interesting that, but I, I don't know if that's something that you know you guys are thinking of. You know, starting to be able to image the brain in connection to. I know what years we we talk from time to time about this, but I don't I'm not tell you now about the project we actually did it. <laughs> we either focus on the brain or on various body applications. We have a couple where we go. Yeah, because that's what PET does really well, right? Yeah. We don't do whole body MR, but we do whole body PET. We've done the preclinic with for a long time. We do whole body uh, PET or well, little body PET. When we started, we had only the brain, that's all we could just bring that. Slowly move to the MMR, but we got there and we primarily focus the exam. Yeah. Uh, but isn't this part of what, say, Ahmed is doing in this study? Yeah, 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 yeah. So there are a few examples, but mm. maybe not. If you'd like. Um, um, thank you very much for this great talk. We should actually uh, end the session right now. Uh, no, no worries. So thank you very much, Uduna, for this great talk, for this great discussion as well. And thank you, everyone here for our first uh, in-person and hybrid meeting to the, to, the per, to the people on online as well. Um, see you next week, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs>